أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبو القاسم محمد الأمين وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولا نطلع على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن لقيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين Dear respected viewers, thank you once more for joining us live from the holy city of Karbala and this is your live show from the holy city of Karbala back to the basics in which I, your host, Yahya Seymour, I'm going through some of the topics which affect us and are related to an engagement of ourselves with those who happen to believe in different systems of belief and happen to differ with us on our major core beliefs. Of course, for those of you who have been tuning in, we are continuing with our analysis and this is, of course, a continuation of our concept of the introduction to the concept of the world view. The worldview is, of course, a, it's a systematic way of portraying how one ought to analyze and understand the concept of a creed or the concept of an aqidah. And indeed, the concept of a religion, for indeed a worldview is not merely an isolated set of beliefs or just the theological aspects of one's worldview, but rather it encompasses everything how one acts, how one ought to behave morally, how one ought to view things ethically. And so the whole concept of a worldview encompasses aqidah and fiqh and akhlaq. And it is through understanding this concept of a worldview that we've been able to draw some interesting comparisons and enlighten some of the viewers, inshallah ta'ala, in regards to what ways they can have more fruitful conversations with those who believe in other religions or other sects, or even believe in no religion. It is through the concept of a worldview that we have been able to largely understand our own position in regards to what our aqidah is, and again, understand where we can begin with others. So throughout the past, say, three episodes now, we have put forward the concept of the necessary big question of whether or not Allah Azawajal, or the concept of a deity exists. And we've stated that if one were to reject the concept of Allah Azawajal, this is not merely a small negation of one isolated belief, but rather this belief has massive implications, massive shortcomings and massive shortfalls, which must be accounted for. Indeed, such a claim is a claim which would end up resulting in other, dare I say, deficient and puzzling answers about the world's major questions. These are not merely the claims put forward by myself. I understand that many of the viewers might be thinking, well, you are at the end of the day someone who studies in the religious seminary. You are on a religious TV channel and therefore you have a particular bias. It's not like you're going to be representing the atheist view very accurately. But I have already stated that this is not merely my own conclusion. This is not the conclusion of a Christian philosopher. This is not the conclusion of someone who has an agenda against atheism. Rather, these very arguments have been put forward by some of the greatest minds who believe that atheism is one of the most sustainable and well thoroughly demonstrated belief systems in the world today. I've started by citing one of the most prominent atheist philosophers, his name is, of course, for those of you who have been tuning in, Dr. Alex Rosenberg. And in his very important book, The Atheist's Guide to Reality, he introduces the atheist concept of a worldview. And what he believes is much more than just a set of knockdown arguments against the existence of Allah Azawajal or the existence of God. Alex Rosenberg fully embraces and accepts that we ought to embrace entirely this product which is brought about as a result of negating the existence of Allah Azawajal. And where has that led us according to the worldview put forward by Alex Rosenberg? He states again that some of the major questions in life would be as follows. Is there a God? No. What is the meaning of life? There is none. 
Why am I here? Just blind luck. Does prayer work? Of course not. Is there a soul? Is it immortal? Are you kidding? Is there free will? Not a chance. What happens when we die? Everything pretty much goes on as before except us. What is the difference between right and wrong, good and bad? There is no moral difference between them. Why should I be moral? Because it makes you feel better than being immoral. And the questions were all of very significant matters. Questions of our existence, questions of our purpose in life, questions of our ethics, questions of moral theory. And so what this has generally led us to understand is that when you remove the existence of a God or God or Allah Azza wa from the framework of your worldview, from the framework of your universe, there would be necessary complications and necessary consequences as a result of doing so. For those of you who tuned into the previous episode, I gave several examples of how this is not merely something we would just explain as taking place with those who disbelieve in God. Rather, those who believe in God as well would be accountable for believing in several consequences of that belief in a God. But what's interesting about Alex Rosenberg's argument is just how far he's willing to go down the rabbit hole. Now I refer to it as the rabbit hole because sometimes when you read these beliefs it really does feel like you're in a fictional novel. It does feel like you're reading someone that is writing fiction as opposed to describing the real world, the world that you and I happen to co-inhabit and live in. Because sometimes it would seem to us that such beliefs are really absurd. Now, of course, I don't want to place those aspects into our hands where it's merely myself judging this as a subjective human being. Of course, I recognize that we as human beings, we all have a level of subjectivity. I might have certain preferences, a preference for a certain color, a preference for a certain type of weather, a preference for a certain temperature, and someone might radically differ with me in such preferences. I may have a preference in terms of which fictional novels I like to read, which literature I find to be the more attractive forms of literature or the most exciting and engaging forms of literature. But certainly what I find here is that there are certain things that we as human beings will objectively say that no, there, there happens to be a degree of objectivity here which is not merely my subjective desire as an individual calling into question what is being said, but rather it is something that every rational human being would say. Now, of course, that really doesn't seem to matter at times because one thing we were discussing yesterday, which was the point we concluded the episode at, is the point that some of these new atheists are quite willing to go as far as to deny the human aspect known as intentionality. Now, what is intentionality? Intentionality, as I explained it, is a basic function of the human mind. I deliberately use the term human mind because I wish to separate between the physical human brain and the human mind. The reason I do so is if we reduce the human mind to the brain, although it has become a very popular thing to do in today's world, we may very well fall into the same consequences as someone like Professor and Dr. Alex Rosenberg. But if we maintain that distinction which philosophers and some other individuals who work in the field of cognitive science have a tendency to do, then we would see that we can make a distinguishment and we would not necessarily reduce the mind to the physical human brain. But the feature known as intentionality, which I was discussing in last night's episode before we drew to a close, was the fact that we as human beings are able to conceive of things through our thought process. I can conceptualize right now that I can conceptualize, for example, the city of London, or I can conceptualize Scotland, 
Or I can conceptualize, for example, the holy city of Mecca. And in doing so, an image comes to my mind and a thought exists in my mind. That thought possesses the function we know as intentionality. Why? Because it is now about something. There is an aboutness to it. As I've stated, we don't normally find physical matter in the universe which is about something else. This table, whilst it might be carrying my papers at the current period of time for the usage of this television show which we are broadcasting live from the holy city of Karbala, it is not about my papers. It is rather just a physical table composed of glass and the other materials utilized to construct this table. There is no aboutness when it comes to my papers. This table is not about Yahya Seymour. They might even write Yahya Seymour on a table, but that table would still not be about Yahya Seymour. There would be no intentionality involved in the process of the construction of that table. And so it is very difficult, according to the worldview of Alex Rosenberg, with this physicalist, materialist worldview in which everything is merely described according to its physical compounds and makeup, to explain away the concept of intentionality. But dear viewers, we will be explaining this more thoroughly after a short break. Please join me after that. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear viewers, thank you for enduring that very short break. Before the break, we were of course discussing the concept known as intentionality. And we were describing most briefly, I understand it's very frustrating. Many of us have probably never heard that word intentionality before. And even if we have, we may have heard it in a very different usage from the philosophical definition of intentionality or its usage in the realm of cognitive science. But that word intentionality, of course, was to describe the aboutness of something. How my thoughts can be about Paris, my thoughts can be about Scotland, and yet we don't have physical objects being about something else. That camera, which is currently recording me and broadcasting myself to the viewers of this channel, may Allah bless you all, it is not about me, it just happens to be focused on me at this particular time. But a thought is very different from a camera. A thought is a non-materialistic object. But how do you explain away that non-materialistic object in light of a worldview, in light of a philosophy which claims that the only substances are material ones and that the only things which exist are those which are naturalistically observable according to the five senses. It is this issue, which has landed, of course, the worldview of people such as Dr. Alex Rosenberg and others who likewise recognize this problem and recognize that a strict physicalist, materialistic, atheistic worldview would exclude these items and exclude these processes from a legitimate explanatory scope. It is this issue which has landed their worldview under the lens and criticism of other very like-minded, capable philosophers. This particular article has been named Could Intentionality Be an Illusion? A note on Rosenberg. He asks the question, could intentionality be an illusion? Of course not. But seemingly intelligent people think otherwise. He states, a still single photograph doesn't convey movement the way a motion picture does. That is to say, a photograph is very different from a film. Watching a sequence of slightly different photos, one photo per hour or per minute, or even one every six seconds won't do it either. But looking at the right sequence of still pictures succeeding each other every one twentieth of a second produces the illusion that the images in each still photo are moving. Increasing the rate enhances the illusion, 
though beyond a certain rate the illusion gets no better for creatures like us. But it's still an illusion. There is nothing to it but the succession of still pictures. Now you might be wondering what's going on. For those of you who tuned into last night's episode, you would know that Dr. Alex Rosenberg likened the concept of intentionality, the, the concept of the human thought process, the concept of me having a thought about something else, to a photograph and how that photograph can be about something else as well. That's how movies perpetuate their illusion. The large set of still pictures is organized together in a way that produces, in creatures like us, the illusion that the images are moving. In creatures with different brains and eyes, ones that work faster, the trick might not work. In ones that work slower, changing the still pictures at a rate of one every hour could work, but there is no movement of any of the images in any of the pictures. Nor does anything move from one photo onto the next. Of course, the projector is still moving, and the photons are moving, and the actors were moving. But all the movement that the movie watcher detects is in the eye of the beholder. That is why the movement is illusory. The notion that thoughts are about stuff is illusory in roughly the same way. This is the argument of Dr. Alex Rosenberg, and I'm quoting from it directly. The notion that thoughts are about stuff is illusory in roughly the same way. So Alex Rosenberg likens our thought process, the ability to have a thought about something else, to the ability for a viewer to watch a movie and be deceived that something is actually going on. Think of each input-output neural circuit as a single still photo. Now put together a huge number of input-output circuits in the right way. None of them is about anything. Each is just an input-output circuit, firing or not. But when they act together, they project the illusion that they are thoughts about stuff. They do that through the behavior and the conscious experience, if any, that they produce. Now this is a quote from Alex Rosenberg's The Atheist Guide to Reality, Enjoying Life Without Illusions. What's interesting about that particular title is it reminds me very much of the concepts which I've introduced in right near the start of this series. Those individuals that you might meet on the streets who are slightly socially disadvantageous, who might have been downtrodden by society, who come to you largely intoxicated or Intoxicated is the best word to use, I believe, in either a hyper way or a more calmed down way, for a lack of better terms. Such individuals who have their perceptions of reality distorted through whatever method of intoxication they have been using. When such an individual comes to you and tells you that, look, it's all an illusion, man, it's all a big game, you don't really know the truth, they're hiding it from us, man. They're telling us lies, and I can see I know the truth. Generally, we don't trust such an individual because he's basically claiming that everyone has been duped, everyone around him, no one can see through reality, no one has an accurate perception of what's really going on, we can't trust our senses, we can't trust our minds, but we can trust this individual who happens to get it right. It's no different from the concept of that movie that came out roughly, pro probably approximately 15 years ago now, The Matrix, in which one finds themselves in a world where it's all just a giant computer simulation and there's no reality beyond the motion senses which are put into the human body being fed via a computer into his mind. When Alex Rosenberg writes a book called The Atheist's Guide to Reality, Enjoying Life Without Illusions, he's basically making a similar claim. Especially when he claims that there's no such concept as intentionality, that we cannot trust our thought processes, and that indeed there's no such thing as a thought, but rather a thought is but an illusion. This philosopher, known as the Maverick philosopher, a very popular online blogging philosopher, he writes the following, Rosenberg is not saying, as an emergentist might, that the synergy of sufficiently many neural circuits 
gives rise to genuine object-directed thoughts. He is saying something far worse, something literally nonsensical, namely that the object-directed intentionality, thought that thoughts are object-directed, is an illusion. So the very thought we have, the very thought that we can now have by even thinking about thoughts, is an illusion. The absurdity of Rosenberg's position can be seen as follows. So this is where we would apply, again, this famous qa'ida of Imam's qa'ida al-zam. Let's see where Rosenberg's words stand when we apply his very claims as to what principles he adopts to his own arguments. One, either the words, the notion that thoughts are about stuff is illusory, namely that is to say, the very thought or the very concept of thoughts being about something, being intentional, is an illusion. Express a thought, the thought that there are no such thing as thoughts, or they do not. Two, if the latter is true, that is to say they do not represent a thought or a concept, then the words are meaningless. But three, if they do represent a thought, that is to say, if the very claim that Rosenberg is making is something which possesses the concept of intentionality, if the former, then the thought is either true or false. But, number four, if the thought is true, then the words are no object-directed thoughts, including the one expressed by Rosenberg, are true. And so his words are once again meaningless. If a thought is false, then there are objects directed thoughts, and Rosenberg's claim is false. That is to say, when Rosenberg makes the claim that there is no such thing as a concept of intentionality, and that the whole notion of a thought being something which is actually thought about is just an illusion, then in trying to teach us this very principle, he has essentially come forward with a thought. Either that statement made by Rosenberg is something that we can have intentionality about, either it's something true or it's not. If it's true, then the very thought that Rosenberg came with is false. And if Rosenberg's statement is false, then there is such a thing as thought. And this is where the problem lies. In trying to claim that there is no such thing as human thought, Rosenberg has essentially shot himself in the foot. And this is the price that the new atheists are willing to go down. The atheist philosophers are willing to embrace this reality in order to escape the concept of God. As I've stated, it's like playing Russian roulette with all six bullets loaded. Dear viewers, thank you for joining us once more from the holy city of Kerbala. And I pray that you can join us again tomorrow in which we continue to analyze this particular worldview, the atheist worldview, inshallah ta'ala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.